facilitate this election. To facilitate this election, I would like to ask for a call for nominations for chair of the Fraser Valley Regional Hospital District. I I would nominate uh, Director Raymond. Second. Thank you, Director Pranger. Uh, before we second that, could we just ask um, <laughs> Director Raymond uh, if he accepts this nomination? So well, thank you. Thank you. Um, so thank you, uh, Director Lum, for seconding that. Are there any other nominations? For a second time, are there any other nominations for the position of chair of the Fraser Valley Regional Hospital District? For a third and final time, are there any other nominations for the position of chair for the Fraser Valley Regional Hospital District? So hearing none, I now close the nominations and declare that there will not be an election and confirm that Director Raymond is elected chair of the Fraser Valley Regional Hospital District. Congratulations, Terry. So at this time, I would ask uh, that Chair Raymond take the position of chair uh, and resume the rest of the meeting. But I would just ask uh, for Chair Raymond to direct staff to facilitate the election of the acting chair. Yes, please do. Thank you. So I will now call for nominations for the position of acting chair for the Fraser Valley Regional Hospital District. I nominate Sylvia Pranger. Thank you, Thank Director you. Ross. Uh, Director Pranger, do you accept this nomination? I do. Are there any other nominations? For a second time, are there any other nominations for the position of acting chair for the Fraser Valley Regional Hospital District? And for a third and final time, are there any other nominations for the position of acting chair of the Regional Hospital District? Hearing none, I now close the nominations and declare that there will not be an election and confirm that Director Pranger is elected acting chair of the Fraser Valley Regional Hospital District. Thank you. Thank you. And I had an hour speech prepared. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Yours, because I haven't got any. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would invite uh, remarks by the uh, new regional hospital district board chair, uh, Chair Raymond. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate the confidence of the board uh, in, in uh, nominating me for chair again. Um, it's been an interesting year. Uh, staff have been amazing in, in working with us and working with uh, Fraser Health. Uh, I think we've made some headway with them, uh, but we've got a long way to go yet um, with Fraser Health and with the province. Um, and yeah, and the working group is, uh, I'm pleased with them and uh, the ideas that come out of there as well. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Chair Raymond. Um, so just looking for approval of the agenda, addenda and late items. So moved. Second. I think, I think Chair Raymond, you've got your mute on. Sorry. That was moved by D Director Fascio, seconded by Director Pranger. And then uh, all in favor, opposed, if any, the motion carries. Uh, item six are the minutes. There's a motion for your consideration. Uh, Director Blue Blue. and Director Horn. All in favor, opposed, if any, motion carries. Item 7.1 is the investment policy revision. There is a motion for your consideration. Trevor Mover. So moved. Uh, sorry, I missed that. Uh, uh, Director Lum. Or Director Lum. Second, second Popoff. By Director Popoff. Any questions or comments? Hearing none, all in favor? Opposed, if any, the motion carries. Item eight is reports from board directors. Any reports from directors? 
Very none, we'll move on. Uh, item nine is public question period for items relevant to the agenda. And we do have our boardroom open this evening, even though most of us are attending via Zoom. I will just turn things over to Jamie Van Ness in the boardroom to see if we have any members of the public or anyone on the line. Good evening. I am joining you from the boardroom and uh, we do not have any members of the public in attendance. Uh, we have not received any questions from the public. We do have two members of the public on the line this evening. Um, if any of those members would like to ask a question relevant to the hospital district agenda, this is your opportunity to do so. And you can just raise your hand and indicate that you uh, wish to uh, ask a question. And it would appear that there is no questions and we can move on to the next item. So the next item would be resolution to close the meeting, Mr. Chair. Uh, motion move. to close. Move to close. Uh, Director Plaza, Director Clue. All in favor? <clears throat> Opposed, if any, carry. Thank you. Okay, and then we will recess the hospital district and we will move over to the inaugural meeting of the Fraser Valley Regional District Board for Thursday, November 25th. It's my pleasure to call this inaugural meeting to order. The first item on our agenda is the election of the chair. So to facilitate this election, I would like to ask for a first call of nominations for chair of the regional district. If I may, I would like to nominate Jason Lum as the chair. Director Lum, do you accept this nomination? I accept. Thank you. Second, Second. Councillor Lowen. Uh, Councillor Lowen. Director Lowen. <laughs> Thank you, Director Lowen. Uh, are there any other nominations for the position of chair of the regional district? For a second time, are there any other nominations for the position of chair of the regional district? And for a third and final time, are there any other nominations for the position of chair of the regional district? Hearing none, I now close the nominations and declare that there will not be an election and confirm that Director Lum is elected chair of the Fraser Valley Regional Hospital District. Congratulations, Jason. Congrats, buddy. <clears throat> Thank you. So um, at this time, I would ask that Chair Lum take the position of chair, but I would also uh, request that the chair uh, direct staff to facilitate the election of vice chair. Uh, go ahead, Ms. Kinnaman. Thank you. Thank you. So I will now call for nominations for the position of vice chair for the Fraser Valley Regional District. I would like to direct, um, nominate uh, uh, Director Ross. Thank you, Director Pranger. Director Ross, do you accept this nomination? I do. Thank you. I'll second that. Clue. Thank you. Are there any other nominations for the position of vice chair of the regional district? For a second time, are there any other nominations for the position of vice chair for the regional district? And for a third and final time, are there any other nominations for the position of vice chair of the regional district? Hearing none, I now close the nominations and declare that there will not be an election and confirm that Director Ross is elected vice chair of the Fraser Valley Regional District. Congratulations, Patricia. Congrats. Thumbs up. Patricia. Thank you. So Chair Lam, I'll turn it over to you where you are welcome to share your remarks. Uh, thank you, Ms. Kinnaman. And uh, I just want to thank uh, my colleagues on the board for again, uh, giving me this uh, great honor. Um, I'm a little worried to ask what's next because I thought, uh, you know, I thought we were uh, we were going through some rough times last year when I uh, made my remarks, and the pandemic was the the big uh, catastrophe we were dealing with. But uh, many of you, uh, in fact, I don't think there's a single person on this call have been affected by uh, the extreme weather events that uh, that hit our province uh, last week. I said it in, prov in uh, council, uh, this is the longest week in my elected career, that's for sure. Uh, the thing that keeps me going and keeps, I know a lot, all of you going is just hearing it, 
about the wonderful generosity and the heartwarming stories that are coming from each and every uh, one of your uh, communities. I know each and every one of you have stepped up in unimaginable ways. You've been called uh, to do many, many different things, many different tasks. You know, I want to single out the electoral area directors in this case uh, at the regional district who uh, I know spent many, many sleepless nights this week. Um, even if it was just uh, playing traffic control with uh, phone calls or traffic control really at the air park, I know people were stepping up in uh, huge ways and uh, filling roles that they're not used to but also just assisting their residents as they go through this kind of unimaginable uh, loss in a lot of ways. Um, the thing uh, again that I come back to is the resiliency here in the Fraser Valley and in our region. Um, there have been tremendous losses, but we will rebuild and our organization will support uh, the residents and continue to support our residents as we move through uh, these challenging times. I want to also uh, just quickly thank each and every one of our staff members, not just the ones on the call here tonight, but all of the ones working behind the scenes who've been working extremely long hours, who've been uh, dealing with uh, residents and very, very uh, uh, anxious uh, positions, sometimes returning uh, back to uh, properties that are complete and total losses and dealing with them in compassionate ways. Um, each and every one of our staff members have stepped up. They've also filled roles that they're not used to. And again, they, I want to thank their family members who have uh, extended uh, you know, the opportunity and compassion and care to uh, their loved ones as they work around the clock at the regional district. Um, it, I said it when I visited the EOC a number of times, it hasn't gone unnoticed by our board. And we thank each and every one of you for uh, stepping up and really answering the call here as we move through, uh, again, what is so, something that we've never been through, but um, we're learning a lot. And, uh, and we're also learning again that you know, the Fraser Valley may be down here, but we're certainly not out. We're working so hard together. We're coming to each other's mutual aid. Everybody's stepping up. And uh, I expect nothing less of this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful place that we live. So uh, it is a great honor to be back as the board chair and, uh, and, and wonderful to, uh, to serve. And, um, you know, I, uh, I'm here again uh, to each and every one of you uh, for anything that you that you need. And, and just thank you again. Thank you, Chair Lem. Um, I also, before we move to item five, I would just like to acknowledge that we have a new face here at the table. Uh, I would like to point out that we have um, Director Dave Sidhu, who is an alternate with the city of Abbotsford, uh, and he is sitting in this evening. So maybe give a wave because it's a big screen and everyone can see you. <laughs> so welcome, well, Dave, Director Sidhu. Dave, you picked a heck of a time to join the board. It's uh, a heck of a time to join the board, but welcome. Thank you. So, welcome, Director Sidhu. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So item five is approval of the agenda, addenda, and late items. And I would just like to note that staff would recommend withdrawing item 11.1 .1 at this time. Thank you. I need a mover and a second. Uh, would not change. It's moved by Director Shahal, second by Director Fascio. All in favor? Opposed, if any, the item carries. Next item. Item six are board minutes and matters arising. There's a motion for your consideration. Thank you. It's moved by Director Clute, seconded by Director Stobart. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed, if any, the item carries. Next item. Item 7.1 is the Recreation, Culture, and Air Park Services Commission open meeting draft minutes of October 21st, 2021. It is just an information item, but happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions on the item? Seeing none, next item. 8.1 is appointment of deputy corporate officer for corporate administration. There's a motion for your consideration. Thank you. It's moved by Director Blue, seconded by Director Fascio. Discussion? Yes. Uh, Director Lowen, go ahead. Uh, I just want to say in, uh, in her favor, you, 
FERD has really captured a wonderful staff member at our expense, I might add. But I uh, wish Lauren uh, all the best. Thank you, Director Lowen. Not that we're keeping score, but uh, I expect it was our turn to steal one back. Uh, any other uh, comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor, opposed if any, the item carries. Next item. 9.1 is a 2021 grant and aid request for the Lake Era Community Association in Electoral Area C. And I would just like to note that um, in the report, it stated that um, we had not yet received, staff had not yet received a comment from the area director. And since that time, I can, can confirm that um, Director Bales is not in support of this application. I don't see her on the line this evening, but um, I just, I did want to acknowledge that she is not in favor of this application. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Kinnaman. Uh, let's get a mover and a seconder and then we'll have some discussion. That's so necessary. Moved. It's moved by Director Clute, seconded by Director Stobart. And uh, do we have any discussion or questions? Dixon. Uh, uh, go ahead, Director Dixon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just, just to confirm it, so this um, Lake Era Community Association wanted to use these funds to do their own um, planning or whatever around an emergency route in and out. Is that the general gist of this? Uh, through the chair to Director Dixon, that is our understanding. Uh, the information that they provided is, is yeah. pretty much what's in the report. Um, I don't have any further detail why the area director is not in support, but um, you know there are there are a list of criteria in the grant and aid application. Um, one of them is support of the area director, but certainly the elected official does not have veto power over community applications. Um, so staff, I, I would note that the the motion for the consideration. I'm just noticing this now. Uh, was to provide direction. So I guess I would suggest, uh, Mr. Chair, that um, whatever motion comes forward, probably you should um, either indicate support or, or send it back to, to uh, staff. So I'll just uh, identify, because it's been moved and seconded here, but um, let's, the direction, uh, Director Clute, I believe, moved it. Um, yeah, I move to uh, to support this as the uh, regional or the motion that was put before us. So you would move to support. Okay, thank you. And uh, I see that Director Dickey has indicated he'd like to speak. Go ahead, Director Dickey. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think I would make a motion to defer this to a future meeting. Okay, so we do have a motion, I guess, on the table and live. So uh, Ms. Kinnaman, I guess if we call the question on this motion and it is defeated, then uh, we'd be looking at uh, entertaining another motion on the item. Is that to correct? Um, well, I'll just turn things over actually to our corporate officer because I think if there's a motion on the floor and then a subsequent motion comes forward to refer it back to staff or is that what I heard Director Dickey do to refer it back to staff? It's just a referral, sorry, yeah. No, defer. Was it deferral or referral? That's why I didn't hear. Yeah, yeah I, I think either way, the motion, the motion was to defer. So, oh. Ms. Van, yeah, Ms. Van Ness, did you want to speak to that? Thank you. Uh, what I would suggest in this uh, in this case, uh, the board has two options. Firstly, uh, the um, the motion can be withdrawn. However, it must be with the unanimous consent of the board. Secondly, um, or the second choice is the board could vote on it. And as Ms. Kinnaman mentioned, um, if that uh, motion uh, is defeated, uh, a new motion could be introduced. Thank you. So. Uh, Director Horn, you had your uh, hand up. And Just a point of order. My question was whether what uh, I was thinking, what Director Dickey was thinking, but as a point of order, my understanding, unless the rules of order are different here, and I'm new, so they may be, that a motion to defer would take precedent over the motion on the floor. It would have the effect of simply bringing it back and that it's not typically debated. 
but just to clarify. I would, think it right. was a referral motion wouldn't be debated and it would be referred back to staff, but Ms. Van Ness. Uh -huh. Sorry, just for a clarification, if this is a, a referral to staff, we, we could proceed in that manner yeah. um, and uh, proceed deferral. in that direction. A was, deferral would be until uh, such time it could be debated at another meeting and put a date right. on it. But if it was a referral back to staff, we could entertain that motion. That's your, um, Director Dickey, go ahead. Yeah, I'd be happy to uh, make that a motion to refer. Perfect. In the uh, interest of brevity. Thank you. And a second there, Director Horn seconds. And on referral, all in favor? Suppose if any of the item is referred, next item. Thank you. 9.2 is a 2021 grant and aid request for COVID-19 safe restart funds for the Lake Eric Community Association. Uh, again, there's a motion for your consideration. And I would note that Director Bales is also not in support of this application. Thank you. And so you're looking for direction then. So a motion either to support or a motion to deny um, is what I'm looking for from uh, board directors. Please, so please indicate. Uh, Director Ross. I guess what I'm finding it difficult with both of these is we don't have the reasoning behind Director Bales. Um, opposing these motions and they both seem reasonable and I, I guess I'm having trouble understanding why they wouldn't want to have some COVID-19 uh, funding to help with the offset those costs. So I guess that's what I'm struggling with. It, it seems reasonable to me, but I don't know her reasons for opposing. Okay, Can, would you like to make a motion to support it? I'll move it to support it in the interest of time, Chair. Director Horn moves. I will second it. And it's seconded by Director Ross. Discussion, Director Horn. Well, again, I, I think um, we are missing some information and uh, I might have a question before a comment. And the question is to staff, is this time sensitive? Yes, uh, through the chair, um, I believe we have Beth Klein on the line, who is the author of this report and she may be able to speak to the time sensitivity on that application. Um, there, through to the chair, there was no time sensitivity on this application. Um, it was for the survey cost to plan the trail um, as well as some website upgrades. So I don't see any time sensitivity. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Director Horn. Sorry, I lost my button there for a second. Um, and I'll hold off in case somebody else has a comment, but uh, my intention would be to do what uh, Director Dickey did in the last one. Yeah, let's do uh, that. I, I move to refer it to, the, to staff to find out Director Bale's position and add it to the report. Second. Okay. As a Adamson. seconder, I'll support that. Okay, uh, it's been a uh, referral has been moved and seconded. All in favor, opposed if any, item carries, next item, or sorry, item is referred, next item. Thank you. Uh, 9.3 is a 2021 grant and aid request for family network in electoral area G. Okay, do you have a mover and a seconder? Move Stobart. It's moved by Director Stobart, seconded by Director Dickey. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, opposed if any item carries. Next item. 9.4 is a 2021 grant and aid request for the McConnell Creek Farmers Institute in electoral area F. Thank you. Move Davidson. It's moved by Director Davidson, seconded by Director uh, uh, Engar. Discussion. Seeing none, all in favor, opposed if any item carries. Next item. 9.5 is the financial plan 2021 to 2025 amendment. There's a motion for your consideration. Thank you. It's moved by Director Blue, seconded by Director Hamilton. Discussion. Hearing none, all in favor, opposed if any, the item carries. Next item. 9.6 is an information item. It's the financial strategy update, but we're happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Questions from directors? Uh, 
I don't see or hear any. Uh, next item. 9.7 is the FERD investment policy revision. There is a motion for your consideration. Move. Thank you. Those are moved Raymond. by Director Raymond, seconded by Director Dickey. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, opposed if any, the item carries. Ms. Lounsborough, nice house. You got behind you. <laughs> uh, next item. 10.1 is the Fraser Valley Regional District Parks Regulations Fees and Other Charges Amendment Bylaw number 1643. Thank you. Looks like we've got three motions on this. So motion number one is moved by Director Fascio, seconded by Director Clute. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Opposed, if any, the item carries. Motion number two, and these look like uh, they're parked, so they're all except for Abbotsford, I think, on this item. So I need a mover and a seconder on motion number two. It's moved by Director Dixon, seconded by Director Mercer. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Opposed, if any, item carries. And motion number three is moved, moved by Director Pranger, seconded by Director Clute. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Opposed, if any, item carries. Next item. 10.2 is the Hemlock Valley Official Community Plan Bylaw number 1626. Thank you. And I need a mover and a second. It's moved by Director Dixon, seconded by Director Dickey. All in favor? Opposed, if any, the item carries. Moving down to section 12, we have 12.1, which is the Circular Economy Leadership Canada Partnership. Thank you. Uh, Mover in a second. It's moved by Director Horn, second by Director Ross. Discussion. Thank you. Um, just ahead. thank you for um, this item, and um, I'm pleased to see that work going forward. Thank you, uh, Director Pranger. Any other comments, Director Ross? Just a quick thank you to Director Pranger for her leadership and I know it's really important to you to get recycling of recycling of recycling of agriculture of agriculture strong advocate for that so thank you thank you director ross and director horn i think i saw your hand up no nope. uh, director ross said the same thing i was okay. going to perfect and any other comments don't see or hear any uh so call the question all in favor Opposed, if any, the item carries. Next item. 12.2, we have the Regional Growth Strategy Update, Phase 2 Public Engagement Preliminary Results. I would just note that the draft Phase 2 report was circulated by email. It's an information item, uh, but staff are certainly happy to answer any questions or discuss this item. Thank you. And any questions on the preliminary results of our Phase 2 Public Engagement? Davidson. Uh, go ahead, Director Davidson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, through you to staff, I'm wondering, could you advise us to uh, what the next steps look like in this? I mean, will, for example, will there be another, um, a revised RGS uh, coming out, or do you still need to consider the public feedback or just what the general process is going forward? Thank you. Thank you, Director uh, Davidson. Yeah. Uh, through the chair, um, this is um, one part of the process. This is the, the public engagement process. And we are still going through this information. So there will be a revised report, uh, final report that's presented um, once this final analysis is done. Um, there's also a, um, an Indigenous um, engagement process that we need to go through, which has been challenged with fires and now this situation. So we are actively engaging um, First Nations communities, um, though you know the, there will be a few delays because of the, the situation we're in right now. Um, and we will be a, um, going back to our um, an intergovernmental uh, um, advisory committee, which makes is made up of uh, local government staff, uh, the province, 
um, some indigenous uh, communities as well and going through this, this latest draft of the regional growth strategy. So there is a process um, that is in place and um, we will be bringing back a updated draft to the board. And when that is supported by the board, we will go for formal acceptance, which is a whole process that is set out in the Local Government Act um, in order to get approval of the, the regional growth strategy. So we are sort of mid process um, and we, we've got some great results, but we also need to, to take time. And, and um, in, in the draft um, document you have, we haven't, um, there's the, um, the text answers to the long form questions, which we need to analyze. And so that will be the next step just in getting the final analysis of the survey work done. Um, and then once we have that, we will have a, a final uh, public engagement report that we will bring back to the board. Thank you, uh, Thank you Stuart. Any other questions on uh, RGS public engagement? I don't see any, and this is an information item, right, uh, Ms. Kinnaman? Right. Yes. That's correct. Okay, next item. 12.3 is the Fraser Valley Regional District Transit Services Update Three-Year Transit Expansion Initiatives. There is a motion for your consideration. Move, Director Lowen. It's moved by Director Lowen, seconded by Director Fascio. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed, if any, the item carries. Next item. 12.4 is the FERD Transit Future Action Plan, Chapter 6, Fraser Valley Express. And I would just like to uh, note, Chair Lum, that we do have uh, a short presentation by BC Transit by Rob Ringma and Adriana McMillan this evening associated with this report. Thank you. Let's, uh, why don't we get this on the floor and then we'll sure. uh, open it up. It's moved by Director Clute, seconded by Director Blue. And Rob, over to you. Thank you, Chair Lum. Uh, thank you everyone for having us here today. I'm just gonna share my screen quickly. I'm uh, hoping if I can just get a verbal confirmation that you can see my screen. Not yet. Not yet. I see you. <laughs> Not quite yet. Not quite yet. Okay, technical difficulties. Let's try this again. I see your Stanley Cups behind you. Oh, still, <laughs> still the Stanley Cups, eh? No Vancouver one there yet. No. There uh, we go. How is that? Yep. Yeah, yeah. We see it now. It's not in presentation mode yet, but we see the PowerPoint. There, we're still there. Yep. Excellent. Okay. So uh, as mentioned, I'm Rob Ringma. I'm the Senior Manager of Government Relations for the Fraser Valley, as well as the Sea to Sky and uh, Sunshine Coast regions. And I'm joined today with by Adrian McMullen, who's the Senior Planner at BC Transit for, uh, for uh, the Fraser Valley. So today we just want to go through the Transit Future Action Plan, uh, how we got here, some of the context, some of the engagement that we did, uh, some of the considerations, and then just some of the targets and updated initiatives. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about infrastructure, uh, as well as share uh, the investment trajectory that we're looking at over the next um, span of the Transit Future Action Plan. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Adriana to talk a little bit about the plan. Great. Thanks, Rob. Um, good evening, everyone. It's uh, nice to see you again. And um, yes, as Rob mentioned, we are here for the Transit Future Action Plan. Um, the, the Transit Future Action Plan is um, intended to be an update to the 2012 Transit Future Plan that was developed. Um, and we are working towards updating all of our strategic plans on a five-year cycle. So we estimate that sometime around 2025, 2026, we may be looking at the next update of this plan. Uh, these are strategic plans that are done for communities of 25,000 people or larger. They are long-term visionary documents, kind of like the transit version of an OCP. The, the actual growth um, and changes that you see in each system are actually determined by the three-year expansion agreements that are signed annually between BC Transit and the FVRD or the City of Chilliwack um, based upon the consultation and review with all of the partners. Um, so, thanks. And so the purpose of the Transit Future Action Plan is very much um, this update of the 2012 plan. You can see on the left-hand side are the goals from the 2012 plan, and on the right-hand side are some of the changes in the Transit Future Action Plan. 
uh, the big distinction, oh, Rob, the big distinction Rob is driving. <laughs> the big Sorry. distinction is uh, that we've we split out the service types um, from in the beginning. Uh, and at the first, in the 2012 plan, it was kind of holistic and it considered all of the services uh, in the Chilliwack and Fraser Valley, the Eastern part of the Valley as one. And, you know, we understand they're all different and they have different needs. So we have chapter five, chapter six, and chapter seven. Chapter five is the city of Chilliwack. The FVX connectors, chapter six, paratransits, chapter seven. And we're here to talk about chapter six today. Next slide. Thanks. And so these are just some um, values of ridership changes uh, since 2012. And this encompasses the Chilliwack conventional system, the Agassiz Harrison and Hope Pair transit systems, and of course, the Fraser Valley Express. The vertical bars represent the number of riders you have every year, and the gray line represents the number of service hours. Since 2012, ridership has grown by over 100%. Uh, it is really remarkable and impressive to see. Um, there has also been um, an alignment in the investment in service hours, which is part of what's enabling this kind of growth to happen. Next slide, please. And if we step back and look at the Fraser Valley Regional District as a whole versus the ridership performance across BC transit systems throughout the province, you'll see that in the last five years, ridership across in the Fraser Valley rose by 33%. Um, and that's more than twice what we saw on average across the rest of our systems in the rest of the province. So again, there is really a, a tremendous momentum that seems to be building in the community and a strong appetite for transit. Next slide, please. If we drill down only at the FVX, you can see here the, the rise in the ridership leading into the 2019 year. And again, really, really steady. Um, so that was really positive to see. And also, you know, um, increases in hours are happening there on that gray line. So that's great. Um, next slide, please. And now if we step back and we look at what ridership on the Fraser Valley Express looks like on a daily basis and compare it to some of the busiest routes that you already have within the urban systems, you can see that it's performing very, very well. Um, you know, the, the Route 1 Vetter has been around for a while now. Um, and then you've got the UFE route in central Fraser Valley and the Fraser Valley Express is sort of on the way to sort of joining that higher tier order of ridership in terms of the average daily ridership. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and one of the uh, opportunities we had during a recent survey was to get a better sense of who's riding the FEX. And this survey was taken in the summertime, so it may not have quite as many post-secondary students um, as we may see during the school year. Um, in general, the ages skew a little bit younger than the regional average. And then also in terms of how people access the FVX, over half of them transfer from one of the local services. So that's really interesting. So, you know, um, I think to the credit of, of everyone here, all of your systems have had increases in service, which enables the people to use those local services to access the FVX. Uh, the other 25% of people walk, that's active transportation. That's a great news to see. Um, and then we've got dropped off and park and ride and then another category. Next slide, please. So the engagement um, occurred uh, over two phases. Uh, this this um, project began prior to the pandemic. Um, and so uh, we had um, an engagement occur, I think at the end of 2018 and then in 2019. Uh, and basically what we heard was that people were really interested in better connections to Metro Vancouver and the TransLink services there. They wanted more trips on the FVX during the weekday and midday peaks. Um, and they wanted to see service into Metro Vancouver on the FVX. Next slide, please. In terms of some of the, the market considerations that we have for the FVX, um, we, there's a strong latent demand. Um, you've had for some time now good urban local service within your major centers of the Fraser Valley Regional District, but that connection that enabled connectivity between those um, is, is new, it's the FVX. And also it enables the connectivity into Metro Vancouver for people who are traveling in both directions, east and west. Um, the other piece that we have coming up, of course, is the completion of the low heat extension. It's going to reduce the transfers, reduce costs, and make transit much easier to use for the FEX passengers that are either destined to or originating in Metro Vancouver. 
um, yeah, this extension is actually going expected to generate a considerable lift in your ridership, um, which is part of some of the three-year expansion planning that we are doing for you. The other piece is the completion of the highway when widening uh, to the Whatcom Exchange and beyond. This creates the opportunity to put in transit priority so that we can make transit travel times that much more competitive with driving and you know, address the barriers that might be preventing people uh, from trying out the FEX. And also it will make travel time more reliable so that no matter what's happening in traffic, the bus will get you there on time. Um, Again, another one is the um, Abbotsford Airport connections. The Central Fraser Valley Transit System is looking at um, establishing a route that goes from High Street down to uh, the airport. And that will drive a lot of demand on the FVX to access High Street from both the east and the west. Um, there's growing interest from the University of the Fraser Valley uh, in terms of their students that might be traveling east from points east and west. Uh, if we were to accommodate the ridership of the UFV shuttle system, it could lift ridership by 250 to 400,000 rides a year. So it's significant. Um, and then there's new destinations and other destinations, some of which are in Metro Vancouver um, that are also an opportunity um, uh, for, for new riders. So Gloucester and Trinity Western. So there's a, a lot of really positive things that are driving that demand that we're seeing and we do expect that it, the SkyTrain extension is really going to be um, a big driver towards continuing to grow your ridership. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so what we um, had in the 2012 plan was a 2% transit mode share target, um, where that is out of every 100 trips made, two of them would be made by bus. In looking at this plan, we looked at the mode shares in the most recent census and also in the travel surveys that are done. And we noticed that the overall transit mode share um, for the journey to work is already at 2%. So based on that, next slide, please. Uh, the plan is suggesting a revised transit mode share target of 3% by 2020. To reach this aspirational level of service by 2040, we would be looking to achieve about 12,000 riders a day on the weekdays by 2040. And this would require uh, uh, investment every two years of about 7,300 hours and three peak buses. Uh, next slide, please. Now, one, one piece here to keep in mind is that this is representing a high growth scenario. Um, we did consider two other investment scenarios that are, are there in case that the ridership demand is slower than uh, what we expect uh, or demand increases at less than historic growth rates. Scenario one is a low growth or a slow COVID recovery. Uh, it considers that ridership may, may actually take much longer to recover um, than, than we, what we are expecting. Scenario two is a historic growth scenario where your ridership continues to grow more or less at the pace that it had been. And then scenario three is that, that high growth scenario, the, the tr investment trajectory scenario where we really are ambitious in trying to achieve that higher ridership um, and all of those market factors I described, um, you know, come together to help drive that, that ridership demand. Next slide, please. Now, the uh, other piece that is considered in the Transit Future Action Plan is infrastructure. All three of the service types that are in the Transit Future Action Plan rely on the Chilliwack Operations and Maintenance Facility. It actually has five systems operating out of it. The Chilliwack Conventional, the Chilliwack Custom, the Fraser Valley Express, and then the two paratransit systems. So it's a very key piece of the puzzle to enabling us to achieve our goals uh, for growth down the road. Next slide, please. Yeah, and, I, can, oh. I can maybe speak a little bit to this sure. one, Adriana, just in terms of um, kind of next steps. So obviously what we are having is we're having some challenges in our uh, Chilliwack facility currently with just, um, you know, continued growth, as Adriana has mentioned, and continued transit expansion. So in response to some of those challenges um, and basically anticipating our future needs, BC Transit and the city of Chilliwack have worked on developing a long-term Chilliwack transit facility strategy. In, and actually uh, formalized into a report, which was actually set to go before 
Chilliwack Council last week, but of course with the flooding situation, it has been postponed. I believe it might be on the agenda for the 7th uh, when it'll get reviewed with Council. And basically that strategy that's being presented um, to Chilliwack Council and ultimately, um, you know, the FVRD board will see that, uh, we'll see that from, from BC Transit. It really provides a strategic roadmap for that future transit facility investment. Um, and that investment would support you know, the investment trajectory that we're looking at, as well um, as we'd be considering transitioning to battery electric buses uh, in the region, which is rather exciting. So over the next 25 years, expected that Chilliwack and the surrounding area will continue to see that uh, population growth um, that's gonna require, um, you know, a transit operations and maintenance facility that could support somewhere between 70 and up to 130 buses. So from a short, time period. The goal is to develop a, uh, a facility that will handle 75 buses that could be uh, expanded as required. Uh, and there is obviously funding available from the federal and provincial governments to assist with the construction of a new facility. Uh, and the strategy is really what we're trying to do right now is advance that strategy to support the long-term capital planning that needs to be done locally in an effort to secure funding and project approvals uh, moving forward with, uh, with the province and uh, the federal government. And then I'll just turn it back over to Adriana to walk you through this slide, which is really a bit of a site map of all of that activity that we see happening in the region in the next uh, five years. Oh. Um, so this is basically a consolidation of what we're expecting or what, what a possibility in terms of future growth will be. Each of the uh, numbers that is within the blobs represents a vehicle. And so if we look at all of the different service types, you can see that there are a lot of buses in there uh, that are required. And so um, we, we are looking at this in a coordinated and comprehensive fashion to try and make sure that we can best address that need um, as it arises. And that yes, and that'll conclude our presentation and we'll take uh, any questions uh, through the chair um, as, uh, as dictated. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Rob and Adriana. And nice to see you and thank you for your presentation. Um, Director Blue, go ahead. Thank you, Sir Long, and uh, thank you to Rob and um, Adriana for your presentation. Really exciting to see the growth in FVX, uh, particularly um, seeing how the uh, expansion of uh, hours has helped as well. And uh, noting that uh, some of the comments were about the importance of connection to Metro. And one thing I know that you're aware of, but just thought I would mention is um, one thing that's related to the, um, the area closest to High Street and to the Abbotsford Airport is the recent um, announcement or the, the work that's underway at the Hungerford development right across, sort of across from High Street. And that's the largest business, industrial park that's been built in the lower mainland since Annesis Island. And they expect, um, well, one building alone would have about a thousand workers and they're expecting those workers to be those who would likely be taking transit. And so being able to provide transit where um, people can come from Metro even to, to come there, I think will be uh, very, very important. So just wanted to mention that as well, because that's, a, that's something to pay attention to, would definitely lift the ridership there. And uh, so those connections to Metro are really important. And then just speaking to facility constraints, as we've seen in Abbotsford Mission, just the uh, the huge positive impact of having a new facility has made uh, is, is just really night and day from what we had seen in the past and to have all of the uh, the new vehicles on the road as well as making a really positive difference. So, so thank you for that and just really exciting to see this on the FVX. Thank you for your comments. You. Um, through the chair, if I could for just one, one second, yes, and, and I think you know, the fuel savings that we've seen in uh, the CFV system with the move to CNG. And again, I think looking long-term for the FVRD and Chilliwack, if we could move along with our low carbon fleet uh, strategy to uh, electric buses, I think we'll see some significant, um, we will see some, obviously some cost to build a facility, but hopefully some long-term savings through the uh, battery electric program. Thank you, uh, Director Fascio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for your presentation, both of you. It's, uh, it's great to see that uh, the improvements are gonna come our way, um, especially in the, in the rural areas where we live, that's uh, the bus improvements. And uh, I'm sure we're looking forward to the new line to mission one day. But uh, my question is, I noticed that you have uh, 
down the district to Kent as a, as a possible satellite garage, garage there and uh, taking in consideration um, the um, scarcity of land. Uh, are you in discussions with the district of Kent or are you looking at uh, uh, an area there that you, you, you think would be the right location? Thank you. Yes, um, through the chair, thank you, Director Fascio, for your question. Um, what I'd say is as part of, <clears throat> we have a real estate uh, team as part of BC Transit. Currently, right now, we are focused on Chilliwack and looking at potential targets in Chilliwack, obviously, for this facility. I think the uh, reference to Kent is a little bit a little bit longer uh, down down the road, but still a potential. So when we uh, when we get to that point, yeah, I'm sure our team will be um, in the area and engaging the local gov governments, likely through me, um, to see what other opportunities might exist. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Director Fascio. Uh, Chair Lum. Uh, go ahead, Director Pranger. Um, Director Fascio brought up a very good point that. Um, land availability in the District of Kent is, is at a premium. And if, if and when, don't wait too long if that is in your plan. Um, through the chair, uh, one, one observation or one comment I will make is that the uh, pot potential for a satellite facility in the Kent area is very much part of the chapter seven, the paratransit development in the transit future action plan. And that is a chapter that is still in uh, sort of its final in, our, in a draft stage. So we will have an opportunity to further elaborate that. Um, and that's where that component is on the infrastructure piece. Thank and you. And what it relates to. Thank you. I've got Director Horn and then uh, Director Lowen. Thank you, and Adriana, just through the chair, just uh, started down the road of the paratransit question, which is uh, what I was going to ask about. Uh, we hear from a lot of the remote communities or the First Nations communities, particularly the access troubles they're having with things like accessing medical care and so forth sometimes. Uh, do you have a timeline for us in terms of when that Chapter 7 uh, planning may be ready? Uh, through the chair, uh, chapter seven is still going through some further consultation, um, specifically some of it will be with the First Nations, and um, I, I'll, I'll leave it to staff to, to sort of fill in on what kind of timelines we might see on that. I think recent um, weather events may slow some things down, um, but we, we have a very good starting point uh, to work from, and uh, as as three-year expansion budget shows there has been some funding allocated already for the future for that north of Fraser route that I know is that really key connection for some of those communities. Thank you and uh, Director Lowen. You, you know? Thank you Mr. Chair. Uh, I was particularly encouraged, impressed, um, a bit surprised, not totally surprised by the stat uh, regarding the growth uh, of users. Uh, very encouraging, very enheartening. Um, and the transit is one of those things that I think we as local politicians often are uh, questioned about, if not criticized, uh, in terms of not uh, promoting it sufficiently. And uh, knowing, you know, it's difficult to take some of that criticism when you know that it's really growing well. And um, with all, like all trends, um, what programs that you see here and there, around the world, when North, I'm speaking more specifically about North America, um, where, where cities, communities turn the tide, that tipping point is reached, where the community, the public says, oh, yeah, we're heading in the right direction. I've got to jump on board. Um, and my question is, where does the responsibility lie for really getting this word out to our public that, look, this is what is happening right here in the FERD, um, we, the, it's growing and it's gonna grow some more, but you know, uh, we need to encourage our public to use transit. I know, I know they always come back saying, well, it, it's inconvenient right now, but the more that use it, as you well know, 
the faster we can grow and um, provide that infrastructure that's going to give them even more access. So my question is, does that responsibility lie with each individual community or does the FERD, does the transit, F, uh, sorry, not FERD, does the, uh, the transit authority have an independent strategy for getting that word out and promoting this? Yeah, Rob, through the yeah through the chair, I can I can take a first crack at it. And, and Director Lowen, thank you very much for for your comments and your question. Um, you've hit the nail on the head. Um, how we convert to transit ridership is by providing the reliability and the convenience um, to make people shift those modes. So you know what we're seeing here and through this plan is that continued investment in transit transit, which I applaud um, this board for. It's a it's clearly a track record of of consistent application of 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 resources and dedication of the transit system, which as Adriana pointed out is showing those growth numbers. Um, so th then we move to the point of, okay, how else do we move the needle on, on transit ridership? And I, and I guess I would say first and foremost, BC Transit does have a marketing department. Uh, we're actively marketing um, our transit systems and the benefits of transit. We do that on an ongoing basis. Um, currently right now, after the um, kind of post effects of COVID, where we have seen ridership across the province uh, dip down, we do have a ridership recovery strategy that is very deeply embedded with our with our marketing team. Um, so you'll see quite a bit of that activity over the next, um, you know, year to two years. But I do think from a marketing perspective, it's a shared responsibility. BC Transit can do our part, we need the province to continue to support through some of their um, literature and, 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 and just discussions and uh, outward um, you know, marketing, as well as even our individual municipalities to be bestowing the, the values and the virtues of transit. And, and I have to say this, this year that we've had, or these two years that we've had, and even the current situation we've had in, in the Fraser Valley, you know, really to me resonate on why it's important that we continue to make the shift in things such as transit. Um, we need to make these mode shifts. We need to move on the climate action front uh, and transit is, is, a, is a key component of uh, reducing GHGs and, and helping, uh, helping out the, uh, the overall environment. So I appreciate the question and the comments. I'll add it. And one more small piece, and I think I'm all for celebrating achievements and successes. You know, um, the ridership gains that this area has seen is incredible. And, you know, you would be the envy of other parts of the province. And, you know, I'll often reference, you know, this is what is can, what can be accomplished. Um, so, you know, I, I would encourage um, you to, you know, own your successes and share them and celebrate them. Um, because you're right, there are often very invisible successes and they're significant. So yeah, congratulations. Thank you. And other questions? I don't see any other ones, but just check to make sure I'm not missing anybody. Chair Lum, sorry, one last, one last comment that I forgot to mention at the start is we did actually uh, re-implement the FVX service uh, this afternoon when Highway 1 opened up um, at 2 o'clock today. So uh, the Fraser Valley Express service is, uh, is slated to run. Um, it was started this afternoon. We'll run uh, starting tomorrow on our full schedule, um, knowing that we will have some delays. But I think that's another good news story is that we're, we're able to provide that transportation from, uh, from Chilliwack uh, through Abbotsford and into Langley. Great. Yeah, thank you, Rob. And I, I was going to ask about uh, those uh, when we would have uh, some of the service uh, interruptions restored. So thank you very much for that. And check again. I don't. Oh, um, nobody else have any questions. So uh, I will call the question on the motion that's being moved and seconded. Are we ready? All in favor? opposed the motion carries great thank you very much and thank you both uh from my perspective you've both been um just amazing to work with from bc transit we uh i know we uh, we get spoiled and get to work with you both at the chilliwack uh, TAC meetings and um you know you keep coming back so you must like us so uh it's it's fantastic and i think you know, the partnership here is worth emphasizing because, you know, we are so very thankful that this is a service that the, the uh, BC Transit, the provincial government steps in and pays a significant amount towards. And um, 
And, you know, I think you're seeing from our part in the Fraser Valley, we're doing our part to uh, keep uh, investing in transit. And we believe that uh, the future is very bright for uh, transit here in the, in the Fraser Valley in the region and, uh, and look forward to many more years of working together. So thank you both and uh, we'll see you again soon. Next item, Ms. Kinnaman. Thank you, Chair Lum. So item 12.5, we have the Harrison Mills Neighborhood Plan Progress Update. It is an information item, but happy to answer any questions. Thank you, questions. Seeing none, next item. 12.6 is Wildfire Season Review 2021. Again, an information item. Thank you, questions on this item. Director Engar, go ahead. Oh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just a comment that we spoke about it uh, at RAX this uh, last month. 60% um, of all wildfires in the coastal fire region are human caused. And it was, the, it was noted at that time that uh, this is an important stat for us simply because in electoral areas, we typically struggle trying to get the province to shut down the, the forest and not allow people to have campfires. So um, I think uh, having that in our back pockets when uh, we ask the province to shut things down is going to work to our benefit. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Director Enger. Any other comments or questions on this uh, information item? Uh, seeing none, next item. Next is 12.7, which is partnering, partnering to increase public safety, the alertable app. And of course, this is an information item and an unfortunately ironic one, since this was obviously on our agenda before the current emergency. And thank you. I was just about to say, wow, our emergency uh, operations coordinator managed to get quite a few things on the agenda uh, and having her plate very, very full. So uh, any questions on this item? Nixon, I have a comment on that, if I could, Mr. Chair. Yeah, go ahead, Karen. Just with alertable, um, just uh, this was personal area H uh, experience um, that I know FERD is aware of, but uh, when they were doing the evacuation notice for um, Leisure Valley up here, um, an alert went out and people knew it. Uh, well, I got a text message from uh, our CAO, so I was aware of it. But I also immediately began getting emails and text messages and uh, phone calls um, where people were um, kind of panicked, I guess, because the map showed all of the Lindell Beach area rather than just specifically um, um, Leisure Valley. The body of the email of the alert certainly indicated exactly which address. And uh, so um, I know that map was changed very, very quickly. And uh, uh, well, so there was a couple things that I learned from that. First of all, uh, it worked really well <laughs> to get to get the notice out to people. They were um, uh, a lot of them seemed to have it already on their phone and their cell phone, and um, and I think that awareness obviously I'm assuming has gone back to alertable to the emergency department. I'm not quite sure how how it actually works. Um, so uh, people were thankful, but they were also quite panicked. Um, and so the good news is a lot of people are using it and uh, it gets messages out quickly. So I encourage people just to really um, uh, get your residents to, to sign up for it because um, it, it was, a, it, for the most part, really was very helpful. Thank, thank you, uh, Director Dixon. Uh, Director Horn. Uh, following actually on that same question uh, or comment, um, there was a, an evacuation alert that went out uh, regarding properties on uh, Hatsik Island. Um, and there was some a great deal of learning for all of us, I'm sure, through these last uh, few days here. One of them is how many people don't understand that the, they live on Hatsik Island, they don't live in Mission, uh, based on the number of calls I got. Uh, but the second one is I gather that it was sent out as a critical alert in error and uh, that it was the same alert that had gone out three or four days uh, in a row in, a, in a, a lower status. But I just want, first of all, confirm if that's accurate. It was well after the flooding had been at its peak. And is there a capacity if there is a, an alert that goes out in error to um, undo it or to correct it? Or through, yeah, through the chair to Director Horn. In fact, that it, that evacuation order did not go out in error, and it was a critical alert. And I think one of the things that's really important for all of us as we've gone through this is that 
when an evacuation order is put in place, it may not be something that you can see with your eyes. And of course, because in the beginning of the emergency, it was associated with flash flooding, sort of a, a get out now situation, it doesn't mean that an evacuation order that comes out a couple of days later isn't equally critical. Um, for the example of Hatsik Island and the properties at the Everglades, um, you know, the FERD, of course, responds to incidents when they're reported. And we had not been informed that there were any problems until that, that day. Uh, and we sent out, uh, and, and thank you to the City of Mission and the City of Mission's Fire Department for going out and inspecting that property on our behalf. Um, and when it became clear that these recreational properties had uh, water up to the skirting on those, those mobile units, that can present structural and foundation problems. It can present public health issues with, with respect to water and sewer. And so it was a critical alert, um, but I think possibly because we've had so many evacuation orders that related to things like houses floating down rivers, it wasn't maybe the same kind of alert, but I would suggest that public health um, concerns are just as important and just as critical. Um, as far as the alertable app is concerned, we of course are still also uh, doing lots of learning on our end. And yes, we do have the ability to um, issue updates and uh, retract things. And so um, as I understand it, uh, that particular situation was dealt with rather quickly and people understood uh, while we were still recommending people to get out rather quickly. And, and coincidentally, um, after uh, the alert was handed out to all of the property owners, about an hour later, we received a, a rather urgent call from the improvement district uh, who was very concerned about the rising waters. And so in effect, it, it could have actually have been a much more serious situation. We're really grateful that the next day we were able to uh, get some very important culvert works done uh, and we've been able to get those folks back uh, into their properties following inspection. Thank you very much. Appreciate the clarification. Sure. Thank you, Ms. Kinnaman. Any other questions on the alertable app? No, don't see any. Next item. 12.8 is the 2022 Community Resiliency Investment Program Fire Smart Grant application. Thank you. That's moved by Director Engar and seconded by Director uh, Blue. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed, if any, the item carries. Next item. 14.1 uh, is an item of correspondence from the Forest Enhancement Society, if it was something for discussion. Uh, thank you. Any questions on this item? Seeing none, next item. Uh, moving down to reports by board directors. Thank you. And directors, your opportunity. Uh, is okay, so yeah, I'll get a bit of a... Yeah. Sure, we'll get a speaking list going. So uh, go ahead, Director Dixon. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I am hoping at this time I'd be able to put a notice of motion, uh, motion from the floor out um, and is that the first step <laughs> or do I read it out? You can, you can go ahead. Yeah, you'd like to introduce a motion. Right. Uh, yeah, so it came to my attention that um, the District of Kootenay Boundary Regional District had put forward a, a similar motion um, it, that deals with lack of cell coverage in the, in the regional districts. And this is particularly a problem in my area. Uh, and it became evident, more evident than usual during this last emergency. Um, and mm -hmm. so, um, so the motion, which I can read out and uh, the staff should have it is, where is the Columbia Valley and electoral the infrastructure needed to support vital cellular tower sites and broadband coverage? And where is adequate broadband and cellular coverage is needed in this community in case of emergencies that block off the community, such as landslides, floods, and wildfires? Therefore, be it resolved that the province of British Columbia be urged to fund the installation of infrastructure that would enable potentially life-saving broadband and cellular infrastructure to be constructed in the Columbia Valley of Electoral Area H. Thank you. I'm seconder on the motion. So moved. 
Seconded by Director Mercer. Any further discussion? Dixon. Davidson. Yeah, go ahead, Director Dixon. Just um, uh, thank you for allowing allowing this to come tonight. It just we have tried and tried many different avenues to engage TELUS and um, other other uh, other the providers and. With so much agricultural land, we simply don't have the business case uh, up in Area H and the Columbia Valley portion. And so um, I just really am um, hoping this can be supported. Thank you. Uh, Director Davidson, you had a comment. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just through to Director Dixon and perhaps Ms. Kinnaman can, can jump in as well. Um, you know, when I read the motion, you could basically do a, a, a search and replace on Columbia Valley with McConnell Creek in Area F and have exactly the same issues going on. Um, you know, the, uh, the tell us um, without additional funding, they're not about to do anything. Um, Ms. Kinman's been, been part of that discussion. And, you know, there's, there's, we have provincial grants. Um, you know, when I read the motion, it says that uh, be resolved that the province of BC be urged to fund the installation. Well, they have the um, grant programs already that require an applicant, whether it's uh, an ISP such as TELUS or local government is free to put in their own infrastructure. And that's such a massive sea change, of course, nobody really wants to go there. But I'm just I'm just struggling with the motion as written simply because these funding programs are in place but they require applicants. And so I don't know if we're, what we're hoping to get from the province that we don't already have today on this one. And I'm, I don't know if Ms. Kinman can shed some light. Sure, and through the chair to uh, Director Davidson, I think what uh, the intention of Director Dixon's uh, motion, and certainly she can speak to it, though, was to uh, encourage the province to not require the local uh, community to have to contribute and uh, is, uh, is clearly identifying this problem uh, where this, there are really serious emergency situations that have arisen due to the lack of infrastructure. And so I think really what she's trying to point out is that uh, these should be fully funded by the province or the federal government. Thank you. Ahead. Thank you. I just, Chair, if I may, just then my struggle is then the same, exactly the same thing applies for, for McConnell Creek and Area F. I, I'm not really seeing the distinction. Um, and there's a process to get it done, but it involves applicants. And I'm just not sure what we hope to get from this motion that the province isn't already doing. But uh, thank you. Thank you, Director Horn. Go ahead. I, 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 I would support the motion, but I do uh, heed what uh, Director Davidson just said that perhaps it might be amended to talk about the remote areas within the entire regional district. Um, there are some in North Mission as well. Um, and so I think uh, it, it uh, uh, I, unless there's a, a rationale for why it would just only be in Columbia Valley, I think there are areas where it uh, could apply across the entire region. Thank you, uh, Director Horn. Uh, Director Fascio. Uh, I'm not on discussion on this. I've got something else to say, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I, anyone else like to speak to this motion? I haven't heard anyone introduce any amendment, uh, but... Sure. Um, Director, Director uh, Chair Lum, if I may, I, I suppose what I was asking to Director Dixon is whether or not she would consider a friendly amendment there. No, uh, Dixon, I'd be happy to. I, I think, uh, um, in my view, the process that exists is not working. Mm -hmm. And uh, I am happy to change this to uh, include, uh, as you suggested, Director Horn, the remote areas. Um, I, I don't think it necessarily should. I'd like, definitely like it in Area H. I don't, I think all, many areas have the same issue and I'm well aware of that. And, uh, and I, I just think it's time we say this is absolutely an essential service and it needs to be funded. Okay, so Director Blue, go ahead. 
If you're just adding a comment to that, you know, when we talk about um, rural broadband, we're also talking about areas like Abbas, which is such a large agricultural um, area and so much of the um, technology these days that controls the barns and, and all the things that go on there. We have many areas with lots and lots of gaps and have the same issue. So um, I certainly support um, Director Dixon's um, notice of motion, but I think that it is something that is more widespread, even in areas where you would expect that there might be coverage, um, you know, in Mission and, and Abbotsford among them. Thanks. Okay, and any other comments, questions? I mean, if I may, Chair. Go ahead. Um, my only thought on that is with the proliferation of, uh, what do they call them, low, low orbiting satellites that uh, some of the U.S. providers seem to be throwing up, there may be a solution coming that uh, addresses these things. So um, I'm not sure what the timeline looks like, but uh, that's kind of my view that uh, there may be things up and coming in the future. Okay. Mr. So, Chairman. Go uh, ahead, Dr. Pranger. Is, has the uh, motion been amended to include um, the other areas uh, of our regional district who struggle with the same issues? At this point, I don't believe it has. Uh, Could I make it what make a, a friendly amendment? Uh, so that I know how much our corporate officer likes uh, friendly amendments, and the answer back usually is there's no such thing. So <laughs> uh, let's put an amendment on the floor and state the amended motion. I think we can just do with amending the enactment clause. We don't need to go through the rest of it, but let's deal with the enactment clause. And what I'm hearing is, uh, therefore, be it resolved, Province of British Columbia be urged to fund the installation of infrastructure that would enable potentially, enable potentially life-saving broadband and cellular infrastructure to be constructed in the remote and rural areas of the Fraser Valley Regional District. So we're going to strike Columbia Valley uh, area, Electoral Area Asia and replace it with remote and rural areas of the Fraser Valley Regional District. So moved. And okay. second. That's moved and second. A discussion on the amendment. Director Mercer. Thank you, uh, Chair Lump. Just a quick question, maybe for some of the which is probably everybody that would know more about this than I do. But given that uh, we know it's a problem across the regional district, would we be better positioned with the province if the correspondence or the paperwork or the request we provide to them actually identifies where in the Fraser Valley it doesn't work? And I'm wondering if it's uh, time that, uh, given this is such a problem, is it is it time that we uh, undertake Kind of a short analysis or study um, to actually um, identify the areas and i see the hands is probably in a lot of areas but just going in with an ask that says fix the fraser valley um, i'm just wondering if it could be a little bit more appetizing to the province if it was more specific and i think uh, miss kinnaman can jump in too but i think uh, the electoral area directors undertook a remote and rural um, okay. internet, yeah, uh, broadband study, and uh, there was some grants uh, provided through that. And I think this probably this motion is probably a bit of a result of the lack of action that happened from the province out of that. You can declare it an essential service, but if no uh, large ISP or telecommunications uh, service provider really wants to step in because they don't see a return on investment in it, then we're kind of stuck in this uh, place where we don't move, we, we, we can't move forward. So my take on this is that uh, we're just asking the provinces to step in, fix the problem, build the infrastructure, take over it, act like it's essential. If you're going to say it's essential, act like it's essential and build it. Um, and Ms. Kinnaman, I know I cut you off. I'm sorry. No, you did. You answered it exactly how I would have. Perfect. That's fine. I just uh, know, you know, if there's ever a time that's right, it's probably now. Um, um, but we'll see. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Director Mercer. And this very well may be um, an issue that, you know, we require kind of amplifying throughout the boards. I know we've met um, a number of times um, on the rural broadband with the province, and we have not received a satisfactory answer thus far. 
Uh, any other comments on the motion as amended? So I'll call the question on the amendment. All in favor? Opposed if any item carries. And now the motion uh, with the amendment. All in favor? Opposed if any of the item carries. Next slide. Or sorry, we're in reports here. Holy smokes. Uh, we've got some other reports. Director Fascio, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have, uh, I basically only have uh, one main thing to say, and I'm I'm well known for not being short of saying thank you. I want to personally thank the great leadership that's been shown by our municipal leaders, electoral area directors on the terrible catastrophe that we're going through at the moment. It's, it's been a tremendous, and including yourself, Mr. Chairman, as the chair of the regional district, you're a leader like all of us, that uh, I'm, I'm just lost for words. And not of less importance, is a tremendous work that's being done by all the staff that are doing this, this terrible tragedy that's going on more so down, uh, down towards Abbotsford than it is my end. But overall, the outpouring from our staff and our leadership, and of course, as we all know, without volunteers, a lot of things cannot happen. And I have to thank them as well. And, and it includes everybody from uh, social services to the first responders. I can't say how, how I admire all of you and uh, you're always in my thoughts and I thank all of you very much. God bless all of you. Thank you, uh, Director Fascio, and you, you've also been a very uh, uh, inspirational uh, leader in your own uh, community and, uh, and I noticed, you know, popping up with uh, nice words of encouragement all over social media and each of our other respective communities as well. So. I uh, really appreciate the, the kind words. Uh, Director Horn, go ahead. Uh, Director Raymond was in uh, before me. Sorry about that. Go ahead, uh, Director Raymond. I've got you muted and I muted myself there by accident. Uh, there you go. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to put a thanks out to staff for the work that they've done up through the canyon with the both Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities in the canyon uh, when it was needed the most. Um, also, I just want to put out to everybody that there was a, we were without power for, goodness, almost a week. And a group of ladies got together in a, with our community hall who has its own power and supplied um, meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the entire community or anybody who needed it. And uh, that just stopped today. Stuff has flown in and, a, and, a, and thanks to Director Rob as well for the offer and, and the, um, the equipment and stuff that came up from the District of Hope. Um, we're still having issues up there, but uh, it's coming along very well. So again, thank you very much to staff. Thank you, uh, Director Raymond. I know your area was one that was very, very hard hit. And, uh, you know, again, pointing out uh, uh, everybody coming to each other's mutual aid. And, you know, that's one thing that strikes me, the relationships that we form here as colleagues on this board where we're able to quickly, uh, you know, give each other a call, identify needs, um, and then kind of have our staff uh, work together uh, again in 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 uh, in ways that uh, we're getting the supports to the people that need them is uh, really a, a fantastic thing to hear about. It's unfortunate that it takes a disaster like this for to show how close our communities really are. But uh, certainly everyone is coming through uh, in spades here. So thank you very much. Director Horn, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, first, uh, before we formally convened, I, I said thank you to many of our neighboring communities for their hospitality uh, toward people from Mission who are stranded in their areas. And I would, I would just ask uh, formally that you pass on 
thanks to all of your volunteers, uh, both formally organized and otherwise, for all the work that they've done. And um, I would also just ask uh, our Abbotsford directors, uh, I think probably the face that uh, the rest of the world has gotten to know uh, as representing leadership isn't in this call tonight and doesn't sit around this table, but would you please pass on uh, uh, from many people here in Mission, they appreciated uh, uh, Mayor Braun's uh, competent leadership and and uh, the face he represented of, of, of the Fraser Valley. Um, secondly, uh, Mission Stands Ready to Help. We were very, very lucky in this whole uh, thing compared to almost every community around us. And um, if you need something, please don't hesitate to reach out. Finally, um, and, I, and I don't know that this is something I want to try and frame as a motion. I just will see if perhaps it can be direction to staff to explore this. But I did hear encouraging or what I think to be encouraging words from uh, the public safety minister today around the possibility that dike improvements would be become once again a provincial responsibility um, after seeing some of what happened here most recently. Um, but I'm shooting from the hip when I say I think that might be a positive thing. And so my question really is to staff if they might consider giving us a bit of their perspective based on their expertise um, on what the implications of that might mean. And if in fact we should perhaps take a political position in trying to promote that. Um, and, and I'm not looking for any kind of a specific wordsmithing of anything tonight. I just wonder whether or not staff can report back on that at an upcoming meeting. For the chair to Director Horan, uh, we'd be happy to take that back and see how we can bring something forward to the board at a future date. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Kinnaman. Uh, okay, let's uh, hear from uh, Chilliwack Director Clute. I saw you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And uh, much, uh, much like Director Horan said, I wanted to uh, ask the Abbotsford colleagues to also extend my thanks to the face that has. Uh, really uh, been in the spotlight, uh, Mayor Braun. Um, obviously devastation in, uh, has been centered in your community. And um, I wanna express my thanks also to the farmers in our regional district. I was involved for three days hauling cattle out of the flats into um, farms that were able to absorb evacuated cattle in Chilliwack and Agassiz and Kent. Um, so yeah, I just wanna extend my thanks. We represent an area with a lot of agriculture and uh, the agricultural community has really uh, been brought to its knees. However, I know they will rise. Um, and uh, I just wanna extend also my thanks to all the um, respective municipalities, the emergency centers, uh, the volunteers. It's been, um, you know, always in the face of crisis. Um, there's always good things that come out of it. And we've been hearing a lot of those good stories and uh, it's, um, you know, the initial event is over. The uh, weather forecast is a little bit worrisome, uh, but we're a long, we're, there's a long ways to go before out of this. This is gonna take uh, not just months, it'll probably take years before uh, things get back to normal. For one instance, as a sod farmer in the flats, uh, it takes them two years to grow a crop. So there's so many different uh, ways people have been affected, but uh, it's been good to see humanity uh, helping each other out. Thank you, uh, Dirk Kloot. And uh, I can attest to the many, many, many hours uh, and late nights Director Clute spent uh, driving, uh, uh, evacuating cattle and driving cattle around and trying to do logistically uh, some of the things to uh, assist with the farmers and some of the communication lines that were there. So he downplays it, but uh, Director Clute, uh, again, not unnoticed the good work that you're doing. Director Lowen. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, Two things. Uh, number one, of course, as is well known, um, the, our Barrow Town pump uh, was is critical, and uh, the residents of Chilliwack certainly uh, uh, came to the rescue. And uh, without them, excuse me. Yeah, without them, who knows what would have happened. Um, secondly, um, you may be aware, and the mayor has mentioned it, um, we were phenomenally blessed by the um, assistance of City of Vancouver, police, City of Vancouver engineers, 
who are, I think they may still be um, active on Sumas Prairie inspecting buildings. Um, and of course the mayor has expressed his appreciation to the mayor of Vancouver. But I was thinking in terms of the fact that we lie within the Fraser Valley Regional District, if not, if, if our own chair of the FERD should not express appreciation as well to, uh, and I don't know who else, there may be others than other than Vancouver, but I know they played a significant role in uh, assisting, uh, just amazing. Absolutely, Director Lowen, I think it's a fantastic idea. And this, uh, if it's not in our correspondence, I did receive uh, a letter from uh, the Metro Vancouver mayors and the chair of Dollywall. And uh, Im immediately he reached out uh, on behalf of Metro Vancouver and the, you know, just like many <clears throat> in many of our respective communities, the question was asked, how can we help? And I know we had search and rescue uh, from many of the different communities in and around Metro Vancouver that came out into the Fraser Valley to actively assist. And I know many of the different staff resources that were uh, offered and, and maybe <clears throat> forward to work here on the ground. So I absolutely think that's a good idea to acknowledge uh, the, the, the mayors and councillors and uh, staffs of each of the, res the respective Metro Vancouver communities that, that assisted us. And, and we can work with staff to, uh, to draft something. I, I don't think that needs to be a motion. I think that's, I think, uh, that's uh, absolutely something we can do. Thank you, Director Lowen. Director uh, Ross, please. Yes, I know people have thanked each other often tonight, and so I don't want to be repetitive, but I do want to add my voice to that. And, you know, when when the chips are down, we really proved how much we're willing to have each other's back and how much we will go out of each other's way. And I know I put one of our dairy farmers in touch with Chris because I saw that he was out there and I know he really appreciated his help, but and I'm going to crack up too, so I apologize in advance, but to go to bed one night being told that, excuse me, Barrowtown pump station was going to fall and begging a friend to leave who refused to leave his cows and then get up in the morning to find out that we were safe because it's Chilliwack. <laughs> Sorry, I can't even tell you how much that meant, so thank you. Uh, let's go, uh, uh, Director Popov, and then direct, uh, Director Blue will come to you after that. Thank you, Director Popov. Thank you, Chair Lowne. And, and <clears throat> one one person's leadership has not been recognized here, and that's 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 Chair Lowne, uh, the unofficial mayor of, of of Yarrow. We spend a lot of time on the phone, uh, updating each other through the alert, and then through the uh, signing of the of the total get out of dodge document which was uh which was a hard thing for me to do it, it's uh you're you're uprooting 300 plus folks uh to get out of town they already knew they they were already uh informed by you i i would i, I would suspect just that the imminent danger is is on our doorstep and and uh luckily um uh, most of yarrow was 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 dry yeah we've got a dozen 15 20 residences that that are affected by the water but uh the outpouring of of volunteerism and 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 support um yeah for sure it was chill out people going to barrel town because there, there, there was only one way to get there but they got there because they they love their community and 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 i think each and every one of you that are on this call here that played a role even even in just uh, messaging and 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 speaking into it, I I talk to Mayor Braun on a daily basis and just just uh, uh, staying staying uh, in touch with him and knowing what's going on. So we'll all get through this, guys. We'll all get through this. And and but I do want to thank uh, um, Chair Lum for for his leadership at his end of the valley. Uh, and 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 keeping us at, at the city informed on 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 what is coming, and 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 working with us with the city of Chilliwack, like we're all together. Yarrow is Chilliwack, Chilliwack is Yarrow, and it'll it'll always be that way. But uh, what an outpouring of compassion! Uh, great communities, 
we'll all get through this, guys. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Popov. Director Blue. Thank you, Chair. Just uh, one thing I thought I would mention, and that is if there is a silver lining with all of this, certainly um, from what I've seen here in terms of, um, I know um, we've had a number of ministers here. Um, Lana Popham was here yesterday or the day before. Um, certainly, um, you know, both federal and provincial uh, ministries are here, key staffers. It's been really incredible to see the way that the engineering and military and others are working together in the EOC. And I know that there are many, many, many lessons learned, but I think the thing that for me is really um, heartwarming to hear is how people are using inclusive language. Like they're, they've come here, likely never even, some of them haven't been to BC before. They certainly haven't been to the Fraser Valley. And for them to talk about it as, you know, a collective solution, I think has been really, really encouraging to see. And so for us to be able to get the attention of folks who might not have really understood where the Fraser Valley was or what the impact of having uh, Highway 1 closed or having, you know, the greatest agricultural area, um, you know, totally underwater um, and all of the situation with evacuating cattle and livestock and, you know, birds. Um, and, and even with berries, like blueberries, if the, the plants are underwater for, you know, three or four days, um, you know, chances are it's going to be four or five years until they get a yield. This is something that's really starting to resonate with people that are not from the Fraser Valley. And I think that that will stand us in good stead as we, you know, come out of this and start to look for assistance in terms of long-term sustainable funding to help us um, both prevent this and also just to recover. Thank you, uh, Director Blue. And I I, uh, I completely agree with you. And, you know, the one thing that I kept trying to emphasize in the few uh, opportunities that I got to speak with media was, you know, you're concentrating a lot on the very immediate uh, catastrophe that's unfolding on the Sumas Prairie in both in Chilliwack and in Abbotsford, but take a step back and look at this map and look at where the boundaries of the Fraser Valley Regional District lie and look at all these areas. And yes, they may be unincorporated from some of the major uh, municipalities, but these are electoral areas, and yes, they may have uh, uh, fewer in population. And I just saw Director Dickey's hand raised, and so he says it much more uh, eloquently than I do. But it's a recognition that this disaster is um, is affecting one of the largest and most geographically challenging regional districts in the province of British Columbia, and it's not just this one event, but it's you know last count 46 or 47 critical incidents across the region. And, you know, it said, uh, again, I'm not uh, splitting hairs here about who deserves more attention or which disaster should get more attention. It's the Fraser Valley writ large, which I consider the, the, the boundaries of our Fraser Valley Regional District needs to get the attention it deserves because uh, as you said, it's gonna need that attention for many, many more uh, uh, days and weeks to come for sure. And uh, Director Dickey, uh, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I just uh, wanted to thank our CAO and staff at the FERD for the great work they've done over the past 10 days. Um, uh, Ms. Kinnaman's brought excellent communication skills to, uh, to this work and uh, has made sure that at four o'clock every afternoon, the regional directors uh, from the electoral areas get together with our emergency operations center staff to keep us up to date on what's going on. And um, it's been certainly very appreciative, appreciated and uh, we are, are very thankful for all the, the great work they've done for us. Thank you. And any other uh, directors that I missed? Director Angar, uh, Director Angar, yeah, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, great to hear all the sentiments from everybody, and I so totally concur with all the wonderful work everybody's been doing. Just a quick brief note that I met with uh, our MP, uh, uh, Mark Strahl, today and uh, had the opportunity to show him some of the orphan dikes in the Chilliwack River Valley, and um, he uh, seemed impressed with the uh, the call on the in the media and locally with from us all that uh, that our, our orphan dike scenario has to change and throughout the entire Fraser Valley Regional District I hope that uh, 
we hear the governments at all level uh, make some changes that are going to help us going forward. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Enger. And uh, Director Mercer, did I miss you on uh, uh, your hand up? I know uh, Director Mercer, uh, he's not saying anything, but uh, his uh, expertise and experience in emergency operations at both, I mean, not just the local, but the provincial, national, international levels. He, uh, well, he uh, shared a comment with us in our uh, EOC uh, that resonated with me and it was in, in, in relation to communications. And what was it? Fast, accurate and or pretty, you pick one. You go ahead, uh, Director Mercer, what was, I forget the actual comment, but it really resonated me about how you want your information. I think it, um, it related back to one of those moments that I probably should want to take back dealing with the prime minister's office where they're <laughs> itching about the lack of information. And I basically told them you can have it fast, accurate or pretty, but you can only pick one. And uh, I paid for those remarks, but I still get a great pension. <laughs> but, but it's all it's always a challenge in these things and i think everybody uh, in the public and the facebook warriors and social media warriors that complain uh, until you walk in the shoes of being saddled with information that the minute you give it it's probably already outdated uh, those are tough shoes to walk in but yeah thank you and i don't see any other comments and uh, I know we've extended some leeway for director reports, but I think it's just nice to hear your guys' voices, to be honest. So uh, if I don't hear or see any uh, other reports from board, Ms. Kinneman, next item. Thank you, Chair Lum. So item 17 is public question period for items relevant to the agenda. I'll just turn things over to Jamie Van Ness, who's in the boardroom and may have some folks on the line. Ms. Van Ness. Thank you. Uh, so we continue to not have any members of the public in the uh, board with uh, boardroom with us this evening. Uh, we do have um, four members of the public on the line with us tonight. And uh, I would just note that this would be their opportunity to ask a question relevant to the agenda. And if you would like to ask a question, just hit that raise hand function. Um, in the meantime, while, while um, they do that, I do have a letter that's been submitted uh, by email, which is an additional option for members of the public. Uh, there's a uh, email here from a Wendy Thompson uh, regarding grants from Lake Arak to assist an escape route for residents in the event of an emergency. And the uh, comment is, I cannot emphasize enough how important this project will be for residents to find their way out of Lake Arak in case of a disaster, specifically train derailment. The residents have been long neglected by FERD and it is time to pay attention. So that's a comment there. I don't know if the, there's any comments from that. I don't, uh, if we don't have a, a person addressing us with that, we'll take that correspondence under advisement. Um, don't necessarily uh, have to agree with it. Uh, we've long neglected any of our areas, but uh, certainly take it under advisement and that item uh, that she's referring to has been referred back to staff to be worked on. I would advise perhaps um, Tops could get uh, in touch with her uh, electoral area director to discuss uh, the importance and, and use uh, her director as an advocate on this board. Um, any other uh, questions, Ms. Van Ness? Yes, so there is a Joe uh, that has his hand raised, and so we'll just um, allow him to unmute himself and ask his question relevant to the agenda. Thank you. Oh, thank you for having me tonight. I'm, first, I'm sorry about your flooding and everything. Uh, my condolences to you and your community, and my hope for a speedy and, and, and fair and rapid and healthy recovery. However, and I'm sorry if I'm a little insensitive, but about the as somebody who rides the Fraser Valley Express, you know, I was disappointed to hear only 3% of a target mode share. I would think that uh, you would be a little more ambitious in a climate emergency and try to get 10 or 15% and really try to get people to leave, to ditch the car keys and choose transit. Um, you know, it just... You know, I, I just really, you know, believe in the leadership of Bowen Ma and Aaron Pinkerton 
to uh, pull off, you know, a much higher mode shift. And, you know, and, and, you know, and obviously the folks at TransLink that don't exactly cover the Fraser Valley. Um, one, one last thought, because I, I know this is a hard time for the people of the Fraser Valley. Um, uh, my thoughts and prayers are with you, and I hope that it will be safe to have a wonderful Abbotsford Air Show next year and welcome Americans like I, because uh, we love your you guys in Abbotsford. You are the nicest people uh, on the face of the earth. So be safe, be well, and if you need help, just ask. Thanks. Thanks, Joe, and I appreciate your uh, sentiments. And, you know, and I take your point about um, uh, setting aspirational goals and the importance of it. and trying to set a goal of, uh, you know, five, even 10, 15% uh, active transit or transit mode share. Um, you know what, I, I, I think uh, it's a good point to raise. Um, I can tell you that we do speak um, regularly. In fact, I spoke with uh, Minister of State Ma uh, about a week and a half ago about uh, some of our transit goals out here. And, and sh uh, not only that, but about really what my group of colleagues on this uh, on this uh, meeting have done in their respective communities, which is make active investments in transit and really prove the case that if you build it, they will come. And we're seeing these um, absolutely uh, phenomenal uh, uh, growth in the system. That being said, nobody here is kind of resting on their laurels. We're making significant investments that link into the TransLink system, which you stated um, you know, you don't think TransLink covers uh, much of the Fraser Valley. It doesn't cover any of the Fraser Valley Regional District. Um, it's the Fraser Valley Regional District that manages our, our transit. And we uh, work with TransLink to interconnect into their system. But um, I think you've made some really good points. The only one uh, I would uh, uh, go back to, and I, I don't take umbrage with it at all, I just say that Abbotsford is, they are really nice people, but I think if you spend time across the Fraser Valley, you'd find that we're all really nice people in each of these areas. So there you go. But thanks Joe for, uh, for connecting. And I hope wherever you are, you are safe and dry as well. And Director Horn, you had a comment. I would just very quickly add that, uh, point out that uh, we're literally increased the goal by 50% tonight. Uh, so, you know, we achieved 2% and a 3% uh, is literally adding 50% capacity to the system. So we would like to exceed that goal, but when you look at it from that frame of reference, it is ambitious. Thank you. And any other uh, comments from board directors? And I don't see any. And Ms. Van Ness, let's take the next question if there is one. I don't believe uh, we don't have anybody else that's hit the raise hand function. So it looks like nobody else has any questions. Thank you. Okay. And Ms. Kinneman. Thank you, Chair Bum. So looking for a resolution to close the meeting. Thank you. It's moved by Director Fascio, seconded by Director Ross. All in favor? Opposed? If any, item carries. And we will uh, take a moment to uh, recess before we.